Hello? All right. All right, so we're gonna get started with our next session. And I'm actually part of this one. <laughs> so, <laughs> woo! Um, so this is a panel. They're all women on this panel. And so when I was, ta and, and that's on purpose, but it's also kind of not. So when I was sort of tasked with putting together this panel, like, yes, these are all the people that I would choose for that panel. And they happen to be women. But also, I just want to note, it's very important for our organizations to be elevating women to have speaking roles and promoting you know, the great work that they're doing. So thank you to all of you for being part of this. Um, so I'm Megan Shamus. I, you know me, I'm the director of marketing for the Fido Alliance. Um, but what you might not know about me is that I have spent my entire career in communications, marketing, and branding for cybersecurity, particularly payment security and strong authentication. Um, I've played a, lot, a, a big role in introducing new standards, um, getting acceptance of new standards. Um, I was um, very involved in the chip card rollout in the United States, which was very successful. Um, and it makes, so it makes a lot of sense um, what I'm doing now. And I love FIDO. Um, you know, I think that you know, being part of the future of authentication, I mean, it, it, it is the present, as Andrew said. I mean, it's incredible to be part of something that is like actually happening, right? So to see a standard gain adoption, you know, and become you know, the standard, um, it's just a pleasure to, to work with all of you and to be part of this. So we're just gonna um, go down the line and, and do intros, and then we'll, we'll get started. So my name is Christine Owen. I am a director in the cybersecurity practice at a company called Guidehouse. We do management consulting. Uh, I particularly uh, work in the IAM and unfortunately the buzzword uh, zero trust field. So. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Jamie Danker. I'm a senior director with Venable, um, which is a law firm. I am not a lawyer. Part of it, um, sort of a TV. boutique. Uh, I try not to play one on TV. I definitely work within the laws and regulations. I identify mostly as a <laughs> privacy professional. Um, I have 20 years of experience uh, in mostly in public sector. I was in the civil service for about 15 years, starting off at the Government Accountability Office, where I audited cybersecurity and privacy issues, and then switched over to the more operational side of the house at Homeland Security and had various privacy roles um, and got to work with NIST during that time on the digital identity guidelines, um, left government and then supported development of the NIST privacy framework. So love identity, love privacy, love the intersection. Love being here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Corinne Larson. I'm the senior director for strategic integrations at UBHO. So uh, myself and my team work with all of our different partners. Uh, we get to talk web often. We talk FIDO all the time um, to help implement stronger authentication solutions between the YubiKey and our partner products. Um, I've been in oh sorry, been in IT and technology for about 20 years now. I started out as a programmer and then became a systems administrator. Spent a lot of time doing integration. Realized a lot of the integration had a lot to do with security, and uh, so started doing more with security, and then moved over to Ubico and became more familiar with the identity space. I just wanted to note real quick that we love Karin, but her mic needs to be turned off. She oh. just talks a little less loud Sorry. than the rest of us do. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if I can fix that. Is that better? I to say that some of us speak. <laughs> <laughs> there are loud talkers on this panel. Says it's about to be my turn, so I'm Liz Vota. <laughs> Um, up until two months ago, I led customer authentication uh, for Wells Fargo. Before that, I was the lead for strategy for authentication at Bank of America. I've been in financial services my entire career, um, and I am now an independent consultant in this space, and I am a big evangelist about FIDO, have been since I learned about FIDO back when I worked for Bank of America um, in their innovation lab. Uh, I used to develop innovative devel uh, concepts for Bank of America before I started in my authentication roles. And I learned about this alliance called the FIDO Alliance and I wanted to learn more and I brought the FIDO Alliance to Bank of America and I helped implement FIDO at Bank of America. So. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to talk about this topic. Thank you all. So I just want to sort of level set on what this um, 
what this panel is about. So we agree. So I think Derek Hansen said on Monday, you know, good authentication is necessary for zero trust. Zero trust is kind of the ter a term du jour. Mm -hmm. Did we put it in the session title to get more people to come? Yeah. Yes, we, we did. did. <laughs> yes, yes, we did. But <laughs> we are here to talk about good IAM. So good, uh, Christine said the other day, good IAM is zero trust. We need to know who the person is, who the device is coming in, and we need to be sure that they are, have the, the permissions to be in and that they are who they say they are, right? So that's what we're here to talk about. Um, but I, I just wanted to add that this is sort of a term that's used a lot in the enterprise space. Um, but we, you know, we're not only going to be talking about enterprise. These are important concepts for consumers. So Liz co comes from more on the consumer side. Um, we're going to be talking about that. We're also going to be talking about government, um, as you all probably know, um, OMB just released a draft zero trust strategy. Um, so government, you know, that's in play here too. So I just wanted to kind of level set on, on what we're gonna talk about. So we are talking about successful IAM implementations. Your zero trust strategy is the buzzy, buzzy way to say that so we get more eyeballs. So thank you all for being here. <laughs> um, so I just wanna ask, and, and this is gonna be like a chit chat. This is not, um, you know, we're not, we don't have specific roles on who's gonna answer what, but I do wanna ask um, each of you to just say like, in your view, what is the number one thing that is an obstacle to a successful IAM implementation, whether it be an enterprise, consumer, or government? Christine, you wanna start? Sure, it's people. It's clear and simple. People are, People are an obstacle for sure, and and it's and they don't mean to be, but they happen to be, and that's okay. Um, part of it is because uh, when you are changing anything, changing processes, you need to have a really good change management, and you need to have good communication with your stakeholders and with your customers to understand why it is you're changing, what you're changing, and how how their life is going to be different and better because quite frankly when we start doing stronger IAM implementations and when we start moving to a different security architecture, zero trust, at that point we're actually going to get a more frictionless experience for our use user base which tends to be our customers, right? So it's really, really important to do that and I actually have a hilarious antidote from just this morning for one of my customers. And so we're, we're actually working to change their security model and uh, change their architecture and we're doing a lot of testing and so we're ready for a large group of, this, of, of people to move over to some new products and, and do more testing. And the response was, why are we doing this? And I was like, I, how many times have I had these conversations with you guys? And, it, and actually, it was, it, it was if they read a little further down on the email, it was all in the email prior that I had replied all to. So, um, so, it, so you know, sometimes I feel like I'm hitting my head against the wall uh, to get that change done. But at the end of the day, all that like blood that's coming on my face from the hitting my head against the wall, it's worth it <laughs> because I know that at the end of the day, everyone's life's gonna be better and we're gonna have a more secure and more and less friction uh, interaction. So it's gonna be fun. I'm just curious, did you reply all to that email and say, per my previous email? <laughs> <laughs> Jamie knows me too well. <laughs> no. Duh. Um, so for, for in terms of obstacles, ironically, I would say trust is the biz biggest obstacle to IAM, and I think there are a lot of dimensions of that because I identify as a privacy professional. I would say that uh, from a privacy perspective, um, there can be mistrust in the use of identity systems. Um, which can be a barrier to adoption. So there are things organizations need to do, like there are cool things you wanna do from a security perspective to improve identity, like these fraud prevention mechanisms and behavioral characteristics, which to a lot of privacy people, really sounds frightening. You know, how are you gonna use all this, you know, the device IDs and um, geolocation data, it, it can, be, can be very frightening. So you need to consider how that information is used for just that authentication purpose and not used for other purposes and think about things like how you can minimize the data, how are you gonna inform your users about, about the use of the data. And I, I think there's another point in there, Jamie, that's really important, and that is thinking about uh, that trade-off between security and allowing people to do their work. 
You know, nobody wants to have to take five minutes out of their workflow to implement better security. You know, they want to be able to go into a computer, a workstation, go to the operating system, go to the applications that they need and do their job. You know, one of um, in my previous life, I, I worked for a very large retail organization and we were working with our supply chain team and one of the things that they stressed over and over and over again, they said, hey, we don't care what you do. You know, we don't care what systems are on the back end, but you can't slow us down. And, and that is really important. And I think too often people have had a little bit of PTSD with things like OTP tokens in the past. And so sometimes introducing concepts like FIDO meet with a lot of challenge and a lot of pushback from the organization. Um, so I, I think that's really important to take into account as well. I know there's been a few different presentations over the course of this week you know, talking about how important it is to understand where people are logging in from, what they're logging into, and then what devices they're using to make all that happen, and making sure that your security picture is really complete. Um, you know, any back doors that you're leaving because you have that secure, like, ERP system that you can't update to be on a more modern authentication method is going to be an issue and it's going to cause friction for yourself, it's going to be a headache for your IT team, and it's going to be a problem for your users, and then you're also not mitigating your risk to the company. And so we really need to make sure that we're meeting our users where they are and coming up with uh, solutions that reduce friction and allow them to do their normal everyday workflow. Yep. I would say that one of the big obstacles that I ran into when I was in large financial institution is that within the large financial institution you have so many uh, cross-functional teams and different areas of the bank that interact with the consumer, but they interact with them in the, according to their own trust model. So what's really challenging, going back to you know, the term trust, is that I, if I design a, an authentication uh, you know, strategy for the contact centers, how does that play in with the branches and how does that play in with the digital experience and how do we create this seamless, you know, it's all one authentication strategy when it's really not. So if you have, part of your organization doesn't trust what the other part of the organization has designed, then you end up with re-authentication, right? We've all seen it where it's like, oh, I gave you all this information, now you're transferring me to this other department and they're gonna ask me all this same stuff again. That's so awful from a customer perspective. So one of the things that I always loved about FIDO was the fact that it's the great equalizer across a very large organization like a Bank of America where you can say, well, I know what FIDO is and I know if I'm using it in this setting and in that setting that I'm getting an equal level of security, then that's a really strong uh, you know, business case for, for moving in that direction. But th that trust internally from group to group is a big obstacle. Yeah, and I think, you know, what we hear a lot, so we, trust was kind of a, we talked about this earlier, we did prep for this, <laughs> I swear. Um, one of the things that we notice when we speak with large relying parties that are, are moving to FIDO is like the trust between teams, but also like the, the you know, getting the buy-in amongst all the different teams. And what's involved with that, that internal sales process is sometimes the biggest barrier to, to implementation. And we do try to assist with that by providing like ready assets for them to help with that sales process. But that's the thing that doesn't get talked about as much as like, oh, you know, we rolled it out and this is how we, we, we communicated with our internal clients or our, our um, consumers about it. But it was like, well, what did you have to do to get to that point? And there's mm -hmm. a lot you have to do to get to that point. Um, and so we, um, when we talked about this panel, you know, we also talked about, okay, so a lack of trust and, and how do we overcome that? And there were some key areas that we identified um, that we you know, need to come together in order to be successful. Um, there's regulation, there's technology and standards, and also like the process by which you, you do your implementation. Um, there's the people, which you know, has come up a lot. Um, and then there's privacy, and we put that in there for Jamie so that she could talk about privacy. <laughs> but no, it's a very important, it's a critical aspect of you know, everything coming together. So 
I want to start out with regulation, and the, que like the question is, you know, how, how do you need to marry your organizational goals with regulation that's sometimes in, in conflict of what you're trying to achieve? But my question is also like, is it? I mean, is it, is it now moving to a place where it's not as much in conflict? Like, or what's the latest that you want to share? You, you're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, so the, the new federal regulations with EO, 14028 uh, are things that I'm intimately involved in right now. And I would say that the one thing that I see over and over again, not just within the federal space and, and what they're producing with draft strategy, but also in other regulatory um, guidance is the term fishing resistant MFA, right? And so I, I'm starting to see that this is becoming ubiquitous throughout all industries, and it's going to be the regulation that we really need to go after and make sure that we all hit that. And quite frankly, that's not incongruent with my customers, with, our, with, our, with, with anyone, because we want to make sure that our customers stay safe and that they don't get fished. So it, to me, I think that regulation is starting to come into what it is that we need to accomplish as a profession as well. And it's great because, right, FIDO has great tools <laughs> to be able to do that. Too that um, you're able to use FIDO to get into some of those regulatory compliance, um, satisfying those those types of standards, but also doing it in a way that isn't a lot of headache, a lot of overhead for your, your end user. And I, I think that's part of what um, the driver is behind uh, adopting FIDO. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how many people here had to go through the headaches of SOX compliance when that first came out. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of stuff in those regulations that had to do with, you know, leaving audit trails, step up off on occasion, all those types of things that caused a lot of disruption for user workflow. And had we had tools like FIDO when you know we were looking at things like SOX, I think that adoption would have been much, much, much smoother. I can't see Liz. Oh, Are you good? <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't have anything to add. On okay, that question. thank you. Yeah, I, I try to kind of do that. It's hard to do it on this stage. Um, the the I love when so Bob Lord, who's right here, you know, says fishing resistant MFA, which is FIDO, and then there's everything else. But to see a go, you know the government come out and say the same thing. I mean, that is. I think Jeremy said this is the. You know, what do you say? The single greatest, you know, achievement of FIDO. I mean, one of the greatest, you know, policy achievements. Um, FIDO is now becoming the government's preferred form of authentication. Yeah, and that's, not you know, just at the table. not just at the yeah. table, but the preferred form of, of authentication. And that, you know, is a huge driver for, you know, enterprises as well, to because, you know, they, you know, so, sort of follow that lead. So, um, can we talk a little bit about process, which comes along with technology and standards? So we talk about like a roadmap. You know, what I know we talk, we talk a lot about FIDO, but when we're talking about you know standards um, and advancements in technology, this is sort of a multi-part question. You know, how can they help enable you? But are there like privacy concerns with any of these advancements in technology, um, and how do you overcome that? Um, and then how do you look at standards like FIDO, but also, you know, how do you compare that? And when do you want to think about um, applying NIST guidance? So that's kind of like a bunch of questions in one, but I'll hmm. kind of let you go with it. Wow, that is a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, try, I'll, try to, I'll try to get it's, it. Done. I have that timer in front of me, so. I'm, I'm not going to pass. Let's see, do I know identity? I don't know. Um, well, I mean, if you look at the OMB draft zero trust strategy and the 2024 goals to get to a fishing resistant MFA, I do think that the NIST digital identity guidelines are already aligned with that. I think it's just making the case that the factors you're using are fishing resistant authenticators that align with you know, IAL2 or IAL3, whatever identity assurance level you're trying to achieve. 
Um, and so I think the standards are already there to get at least federal agencies to that place. Um, from a privacy perspective, I just think the other, the additional things that are already addressed in the digital identity guidelines, um, it's not a shall statement, but it is a should statement. Um, I can't remember which volume it is, but that um, agencies are supposed to take um, fraud prevention, fraud mitigation measures, and that includes those things like behavioral characteristics, um, things that you know, might raise privacy concerns. Um, but there are requirements in the guidelines also that if you're going to do that, that you should conduct something called a, a privacy risk assessment. Um, some of you might consider those to be privacy impact assessments. Um, so you would go to other NIST guidance to kind of help you with that. There are lots of really cool resources out there, including the NIST privacy framework, which um, hopefully everybody's familiar with. It's pretty new. It's um, uh, very similar to the NIST cybersecurity framework. They're overlapping categories and subcategories. It follows the same sort of structure, but it's geared more towards the privacy risks that um, are sort of outside that intersection of cybersecurity and privacy. Um, and then there's an oldie but goodie, um, the NIST introduction to privacy engineering, which actually has a methodology attached to it where you could, you know, if you're gonna do these behavioral characteristics, there's a whole process out there where you can uh, identify the data that you would collect, the data actions, and then identify areas of potential risk, and then mitigations for, for those risks. So the whole idea when the digital identity guidelines is not to tell agencies, you know, hey, this is, this is bad, um, you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z. It's do a risk assessment process and actually evaluate this, um, because the fraud prevention mechanisms are actually privacy protective in a way, but you want to do it in a way um, that's not going to create greater privacy risk for your organization. Yeah, 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 and to that point, like, that was, a, I mean, I don't mean to keep harping on how great FIDO is, but um, from a privacy perspective, it's just built in. The privacy protection is built into the fact that it's, you know, on device. It's not sitting in a server somewhere for someone to, uh, you know, to breach. And I always, um, you know, would feel really good when you would read in the paper there's some kind of uh, breach somewhere. Um, of, of a biometric, and then the the trickle down would happen from you know senior executives down. Like, do we have anything like that at the bank? Do we have anything sitting in a server that would be? Nope, no, we don't. No, we don't. Thankfully, <laughs> so you know it was always a, a breath of fresh air when you can think about the privacy built in to the FIDO standard. bit of a counter argument to that because I know we've had a few enterprises that uh, we've worked with as Ubico um, that have wanted a little bit more control uh, over who's logging in, who's authenticating, knowing more about their user. And so sometimes there's that, that balance, uh, of yeah, course. Yeah. Yep. Push and pull yep. kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, and I, I see that as like, it, the, the question is, um, so when you think about the user, what kind of access they have to the entire system, and also, like, are they an internal user, are they a privileged user, or are they an external customer? And so I, I agree. I think sometimes you want more than just, you, you want more than the bare bones of yes or no, they should come in. But I, I think this is why FIDO is so great, especially for our consumer-driven like interactions online because we have the strong the the, the phishing resistant strong authentication for those of us so so that our stuff is protected, but then internally we can we can do other things to make sure that attributes are exchanged so that we can um, we can come up with. A stronger authentication, like a contextual authentication methodology for internal users to make sure that those users are accessing the, that really good data and, and that they should be accessing, right? So when we, when we kick this off, I know you said people. Yeah. Um, Liz kind of said that too, because she was talking about teams. Um, so if we, let's talk about people in two, two ways. So people inside the org, people outside the org, if we maybe we'll start with the inside, but what are the, you know, the considerations that you would advise, you know, folks to keep in mind when, you know, you're implementing um, for the people in, in the inside? So internally, um, I think there's a couple things. I think, I, I think that 
you have to focus on the data first, and then you work your way backwards, right? So this is why like, I love Jamie so much, because I think that we need to work together on everything moving forward. I think data, uh, like making sure that the data stays safe and secure and like privacy is kept intact is super important for all IAM implementations. Um, and and I, so the way I see it, and this is in a lot of the NIST methodologies, um, you start out looking at the data and the types of data, and then you start to think what kind of internal users should have access to this data. And you make sure, and, and so then moving to our favorite buzzword, zero trust, you protect at that data level or at that application level instead of through that firewall, like moat-like level so, so that we reduce the amount of lateral movement and the attack vector uh, for that data. And so in doing that, I, I think that's how you have to work backwards. It's kind of like solving a very complex equation because not every application will have the exact same way that a person gets into that application. And um, But I think that, I don't know, I like it because it's, it's really complex and it's a lot of fun to solve. So <laughs> that's just me though. Internal's not my sandbox, that's your yeah. sandbox. So. Yeah. But you have external. Yeah. yeah, I can talk about external, yeah. sure. Um, so people from an external perspective is you know, clearly the customer. Um, the customer is a big part of the, your zero trust strategy because in order for um, your authentication to work, it has to be adopted and customers have to be able to complete it without um, it creating havoc for them and what they're trying to do. So, uh, you know, clearly you have to understand the customer behavior, do, you know, user experience testing um, with your strong customer authentication solutions, um, and make sure that you're ready for the, um, the impact that this is going to have on your customer experience. Um, the, you know, the idea that you can't just trust anyone just because they have a username and password um, is, you know, different than where it's been in the past. Um, the whole strong authentication movement is one that customers are not asking for directly. So anytime you're imposing that on them, you're gonna have to make sure that whatever it is you're doing is gonna meet their needs as well as your, your strategy. So it's pretty important for them to be happy with what they're doing. So uh, from my perspective, a lot of it has to do with doing internal implementations more than consumer facing implementations, and uh, a lot of that just is about communication. You know, prepping your user base, making sure they know what's coming, what's expected of them, that you have clear instructions around onboarding themselves, what they need to do, you know, what is, what will change uh, going forward, and making sure that you're communicating that with all of, of the different internal teams. Uh, you know, often in an enterprise, you have many different business applications, support groups, security touches, all of those. So all of those teams need to be part of your rollout plan and have bought in to any changes that you're making in terms of implementing FIDO. Yeah, so I don't know how many folks attended um, Tom Sheffield's um, talk yesterday about targets, enterprise implementation, and what struck me by it was, I mean, frankly, the messaging that they used for um, getting their employees, you know, enrolled and on board, it was, it's very similar to what you would do with consumers. It's just about, like, consistency of message and then having those messages available at basically every touch point um, that, you know, that employee or consumer um, you know, see, so whether it's, you know, across all different channels. Um, so that really struck me because it's not that dissimilar when it comes to doing the rollout. I um, mean, that's the other reason why we at Fido Alliance, you know, have, are doing the UX research and, um, you know, we're actually, you know, doing research, researching users and, you know, trying to provide some guidance that will allow relying parties to do this on a, cons you know, in a consistent way. Um, because what I learned when we rolled out the chip cards was, 
every issuer, we actually, we had issuer packets. They, every issuer got kind of a guide of this is what you should do when you send this card, and they all did it. And really, there wasn't much of a, an issue with the consumer rollout. Like, they did it once, and that was it. You know, there was a lot of, like, hemming and hawing around, like, well, it's a, they have to stick it in the thing, and what do we call it, dip? Or what do we, they'll do it one time. It's, they have to learn it once, and then, you know, they'll get it. And I think a lot of that with, it's, can be said for FIDO as well, where we found, like, once they got it, they were like, oh, okay. And then if they see another relying party doing the same thing, they'll say, oh, that's the thing I do at, you know, Bank of America or whatever. I'm gonna, yeah, I trust that. That's, I know what that is and I trust that. So that's you know, a, a, a big part of you know, what we're trying to achieve at FIDO Alliance with our loginwithfido.com website and the UX guidance. I know, I'm sorry, I'm plugging everything. I can't help it. I think the great thing about this uh, and what you guys are doing is the fact that like, it's so easy and, w and like you said, once you learn it once, it, it like runs on the back end of the customer doesn't really have to know what's going on. But they, but there's, back to Jamie with trust. There's this trust that it's secure. So I think it's really, I think it's awesome. Like you guys are like doing God's work out there. You're getting oh, a lot of good you. stuff done. <laughs> Megan. Meg. <laughs> so we're gonna wrap up. Um, we we have a little time. If you anything you wanna add for the. Uh, no, I mean take questions. If Anybody have any questions any for us? Make them softballs, please. <laughs> Everybody wants to eat. I know. Yeah, so we are gonna. So thank you so much. Um, we're gonna break for lunch, and we'll meet back here at two. Thanks for coming. Thank you.